All right, hi everyone. We're gonna go ahead and get started. I think everyone's done with their pre-tests. Um, so thank you for joining us today. This is our first Mesa dissection. Um, we are a group of anatomy fellows here at AT Still University. So I'm Lauren Newhart. Uh, I'm actually from St. Joseph, Missouri. So the Northwest Missouri site, um, I'm from where you guys are from. Um, and I'll be kind of t walking us through the lecture portion of today. And then... And my name is Blake Stringham. I'm from Utah. Uh, and so, uh, like she said, we're the anatomy fellows here at AT Still University. Those of you that are over in the micro lab here on campus are uh, also going to be with the anatomy fellows, Baden and Brittany. And so, essentially, we are second year medical students uh, that have gone through the first two years of medical school and then have taken an additional year uh, to help teach anatomy to various uh, medical students and also things like this. So we get involved in education and uh, uh, we'll be, we're really excited to be with you today. I I'm going to be jumping in in uh, a little while and helping you uh, explain uh, what you're going to be seeing when we dissect through the cadet or through the uh, jawbone. So, uh, let us know at any time if there's any type of uh, difficulties with sound. I have the chat up right here, so we'll be able to get questions from you at any time and we can address those. But uh, how's the sound so far? Could, could you guys just let us know if things are going okay? I think we're good. All right, thank you. Okay, so if sounds all right, then I'm just gonna go ahead and switch screens here and pull up the PowerPoint for you guys. Um, oh, it's like flying through. Okay, so, uh, Today you can see this is learn more about your mouth. Um, and we're gonna be dealing uh, with cow jaws here at the Northeast Missouri site. And then it sounds like we'll be doing pig jaws at the Northwest Missouri site. So everything should still be applicable. And it might just be a little bit different from um, species to species. Uh, uh, again, I'm Lauren. So I'm gonna be walking you through this lecture today. So first thing is we're going to just kind of walk um, kind of superficial to deep. And we're going to start with the lips. So you guys probably already know this. This is kind of the opening to the oral cavity. The lips help us to make precise movements and help articulate sound so that we can speak clearly. And then um, it's kind of forming a valve for the GI system. So we keep food in the mouth while we're chewing, and then we can go ahead and swallow that food down into the esophagus. And something kind of uh, different about the lips is that uh, even though this is a type of skin, they lack hair follicles and oil glands, so the lips can dry out really easily, which you're probably aware of. That's why a lot of people use chapstick or other kinds of moisturizers on their lips. So that will actually bring us to our first um, kind of clinical correlation of the lips. This is something called chelitis. This is basically a drying out and in inflaming uh, inflammation of the lips. And on the left, you can see these are just your basic chapped lips. It can go all the way to a widespread inflammation on the right. So it can get pretty serious and you may even require like steroids or some sort of anti-inflammatories. Okay, uh, another thing that can affect the lips, which maybe you guys have heard of, uh, this is herpes labialis, which most of you probably know as the common cold sore. These are basically painful blisters. They can be on the inside or outside of the lips, and they're caused by herpes simplex virus one. And then they usually heal on their own after about 10 days. Uh, but you do actually hold the, the virus stays dormant in your body for life. So that's why um, sometimes when people are really stressed out, they may break out with a cold sore on their lip. And um, they can really be um, 
kind of exacerbated by acidic foods like orange juice or ketchup, those can really make these sores hurt a lot. Okay, so we've kind of just talked about the lips just a little bit. Now we're going to move a little bit deeper and just kind of look at an overarching view of the muscles of facial expression. So I'm not going to talk about each one of these individually because there, you can see there's quite a few. But I just want you to realize and get an appreciation for how many muscles are basically underlying the skin of our face and helping us to literally make faces. Uh, smiling, frowning, wrinkling your nose, wrinkling your eyebrows. There are multiple muscles that kind of work in sympathy uh, under the skin of your face to make these expressions. So quite a few here are actually focused around the mouth and they help us to close the mouth, to lift the corners of the mouth to smile, to kind of depress the corners of the mouth to frown. Um, so you can see there's quite a few muscles working in symphony to make the different um, motions of the mouth. Okay, and then um, so we've gone from superficial lips down to muscles and now we're all the way down to bone. So the two main bones that make up the jaw, shall we say, is this lower portion called the mandible. So it's the mobile part. So as you talk, as you chew, as you make any motions with your mouth, the mandible is really what's moving. And then this upper portion, the maxilla, is the more stationary part. You can see that there. Um, the upper part of the jaw, there are a couple other smaller bones um, called the palatine and sphenoid bones. They're not shown in this picture. Um, they are part of the upper part of the jaw, but the main portion we want you to know is the maxilla. Okay, so mandible is lower and the maxilla is the upper. So then as we um, we're going to look at a few more muscles here. These are called the muscles of mastication. So mastication means chewing. And these are literally the muscles that are going to help us chew food. So they're really moving that, that lower portion of the jaw, the mandible, around in different directions. So this first one up here is called temporalis. And you can probably feel it on yourselves if you kind of clench your jaw shut and feel it like up near your temples. You can, you can feel that um, muscle contract. Um, and it kind of helps to elevate or lift up the mandible. So it helps you to bring the, the mouth closed once you've had it in an open position. This other one here is called the masseter. Uh, so again, go ahead and clench your teeth and maybe feel here in the meat of your um, cheek. You can actually feel that muscle. That helps also elevate the mandible. So that's the masseter. That's kind of the portion that makes your cheek a little bit um, fuller or, or thicker. And then there's these two little muscles. They're called pterygoids. So there's a medial one, which means more towards the midline and then a lateral pterygoid, which is um, more towards the outside of your face. And they kind of sit together and they're also, let's see, let me scroll down here. There we go. So those are also sitting kind of towards the middle of the mouth and they help move the mandible from side to side. So if you wanted to open your jaw and then move your corners of your mouth from side to side, those are the pterygoids that help you do that. And all of these muscles I just listed, these four muscles, um, they're innervated by a nerve called the mandibular nerve. So the mandible is that lower portion of the jaw. And the, the nerve that innervates them is called mandibular nerve. And it's the third branch off of one of our cranial nerves. And then all of the muscles of facial expression, they're all innervated by uh, branches of the facial nerve. So that makes sense. It's another cranial nerve, cranial nerve seven, uh, facial nerve for our muscles of facial expression, and then this mandibular nerve for our, our chewing muscles, our mastication muscles. Okay, so we, we're kind of moving on now. We're going to go a little more interior to the oral cavity, and we're going to talk about the teeth. So um, kind of Something that is commonly misconstrued, a lot of people think that the teeth are made of bone, but they're actually not. So the teeth are here to help us break down food. And something kind of interesting about humans is that we are polyphyodont. 
So that means that we have more than one set of teeth in our lifetime. I'm guessing you guys have probably heard about um, what, what some people call baby teeth. Uh, the actual name would be deciduous. So in, um, kind of in our younger years, we have 20 baby or deciduous teeth. And then we, um, we get our permanent teeth and there are 32. So this is different. Some animals are, are mono, uh, mono polyphyodont, meaning they only have one set of teeth for their whole life. And then there are even some animals that are polyphyodont, like humans are, but in a much different way. There are actually some sharks that get a new set of teeth like every two weeks. So that's different than, than us, even though they are considered also polyphyodont. Okay, so as we kind of move on and talk about the teeth, there's different types of teeth. So these first front four teeth on the top and bottom, those are our incisors. So there's eight total, four on the bottom, four on the top. And um, you can see that they are kind of flat in the front, but they're pretty sharp, so they kind of help cut our food. And they're, they're typically the first of the baby teeth to show up. So sometimes when, when your infant starts growing teeth, they get that really toothy grin up front. Those are their incisors that are coming in. And they're really, since they are sharp on top, they kind of help cut the food and I already said they're the first to show up in children. So then as we move just a little more lateral, we have what are called the canines. So there are, there's one on each, each side of our incisors on top and bottom. That means there are four total. And they are also sharp pointed teeth and they kind of help firmly hold the, the food and then tear it apart. So they're not quite as important uh, in humans, but if you can imagine in animals that don't have, you know, hands and forks and utensils to help hold their food in their mouth, these canines are really important. And you can see that they're fairly sharp in different kinds of animals um, to help kind of hold the food in the, in the oral cavity and the tear. Okay, so just moving a little more lateral, now we have what we call the premolars, and there are two on each side, top and bottom, so that's a total of eight. So this is actually our 20 baby teeth, or deciduous teeth, that we've just talked about. Our incisors, then our canines, and now our premolars. So these premolars are a little bit flatter, and they're really helpful for crushing food. And then, um, let's see, the last type of teeth are the molars. So we've moved from premolars back to molars. And these are not teeth that you would have in your set of baby teeth. So you can see we have six highlighted here in yellow on the bottom. There's six on the top. So these molars are what make the difference between our 20 baby teeth and our 32 adult teeth. And they are um, the biggest and flattest surface of all the teeth. And they're really good for grinding and crushing the food into really small pieces. So as you kind of work on, maybe you've been chewing gum or um, chewing on like a big piece of meat or steak or something, these molars are really what grind that down into the smallest pieces. So if we have just talked about our molars, now we can look at something that uh, is fairly common, um, sometimes in late teenage years or um, your early 20s, um, and you've probably heard of them. It's uh, called a tooth impaction, and it's fairly common on these, um, what we call the wisdom teeth, which is that back molar, the, the, the furthest back molar on each side um, on the top and bottom. So there's four wisdom teeth. And sometimes when they grow in, they can grow in um, really sideways or there's just not any room for them to grow in because they don't grow straight up out of the gum. So at some point, they just run out of room to grow and they sit there and they affect your other teeth. So that's why it's quite common for people to have their wisdom teeth cut out. Um, so that's kind of talking about the different types of teeth. Now we're going to look at the different parts of the teeth. So there's a couple different ways that we can break it down. Uh, kind of most simply, we can just look at what's above the gum line and what's below the gum line. So over here on the right, you can see that above the gum line, basically what's visible of the tooth, we can call the crown. And then below the surface, which is not visible to the um, eye, would be the root of the tooth. 
And that's about two thirds of the length of the tooth is actually below the surface of the gums. Um, and then if we look on the left, we can actually kind of work from um, the outer exterior to the inner part of the tooth. So this enamel, this is, you know, basically the white of the tooth and it's uh, pretty strong and it's really there to protect the teeth from wear, the normal wear and tear. Um, and then we move just a little bit more. Uh, oh, one thing I will mention. So in the root of the tooth below the surface of the gums, there's something called cementum. It's not pictured here, but you can imagine if it's on the root of the teeth, it's basically helping it adhere to the gum around it. So it's kind of a cement-like thing that's keeping the roots of the teeth attached to the gums around it. So it's kind of uh, analogous to the enamel that's up on the visible crown. It's just below the surface of the gums. So now if we move um, kind of internal to the enamel, we have what's called the dentin. So you can see that it's there. It's kind of a more yellowish color in this image. So the dentin is this deeper layer, and it has some nerve fibers in it for sensation. So, um, you know, if you were to have some uh, enamel wear away, you may actually get some sensitivity with your teeth when dentin is exposed. Not as bad as the pulp, but there are some nerves going through there. So it can be kind of painful or have some kind of strong sensations when that's kind of um, exposed to the surface. And then uh, most internal in the tooth, and you can see it's down here in the root, this is called the pulp. So the pulp is the center of the tooth, and this is basically where all the blood supply and most of the nerves that are traveling in and supplying the tooth are gonna be found. Okay, so if we kind of think about that process or the uh, external to internal, and then we can kind of apply it to something called tooth decay. You guys have probably heard about this. Um, they're called dental caries, but you most commonly hear them known as cavities. So basically, if we're working from left to right here, you can see that plaque forms uh, from a combination of sugars and bacteria in the mouth. They basically adhere to that um, enamel, and then they harden to form plaque. Then plaque hardens to form tartar. So this tartar can build up on the external part of your tooth, and then when bacteria um, breaks down these sugars, they form acids. And acids can kind of, over time, erode through the enamel. And this isn't painful, but it is that first step into forming a cavity. So it's really nice if you can, you know, kind of catch this process early so that there's not long-term damage to the tooth. But if we move further along and the, and the erosion happens through the enamel and gets down to the dentin, the dentin is a lot softer than that outer kind of protective enamel coating. So that once this happens, erosion occurs a little quicker and it can be painful because there are some nerve fibers going through the dentin. So this is when maybe a cavity first starts hurting or when you first realize you have one or maybe have the start of one. But then if it continues, see, say you don't go to the dentist or you just you don't have time to, to worry about it, your erosion can maybe go all the way down to the pulp. And this is where all those nerves and blood vessels are. And it is very painful. And this is when you'll probably wish you'd already gone to the dentist. So another kind of view of the same thing. Um, so we're talking about that early tooth decay causing a cavity. It can kind of erode all the way down into the pulp. Well, that pulp can get really swollen and infected. And if this goes on long enough and gets bad enough, it can actually form something called an abscess. As you can see here in picture C, it's just a, basically a pocket of swelling and inflammation and bacteria that forms down at the root of the tooth in the pulp. So um, if this does happen and it's visible, it'll, it'll typically look like this picture on the left. Um, they can be really painful and they pretty much always require treatment. And then if the inflammation extends far enough, it can actually cause visible facial swelling. Um, so you can see that on the right here, her right cheek is fairly swollen. Um, and one way to kind of fix these abscesses is something called a root canal. And that's if it's gone on and it's gotten fairly extensive. That's not always your first um, go-to to fix 
uh, cavities per se, but if it's gone into an abscess, a root canal is some way you can fix that. So you basically make this opening in the tooth and then you go into that pulp where the infection was and you remove all of this stuff, basically where the blood supply and nerves were, and you clean out that entire cavity. So you can see here, all of this pulp is being cleaned out. And then um, you're gonna go in and kind of fill in that area, that pulp with a cement-like material. Then you're gonna seal it with a filling and then cover it with this crown on top. So the tooth is essentially dead and then the crown is put on top for cosmetic reasons so it'll continue to look white or match the other um, the color of your other teeth um, if you don't require a um, root canal for an abscess but say you have cavities you've probably heard of fillings so this is basically just removing that more external decayed material you can go in with a drill and kind of go through the uh, enamel and the dentin that's affected and then they they go in they they clean out all of that material and then they'll use um, kind of either a silver alloy or a resin that's white so it matches the color of the tooth and they just fill in the little gap so we didn't get down all the way to the pulp so it may have been a little bit painful but not like um, when it extends all the way down to the pulp okay so we've kind of, we talked about the outer portion of the oral cavity. We've talked about the teeth. Now let's talk about the gums. So another word for the gums is the gingiva. And it's a special skin layer that lines part of the jaw and the deeper portion of the teeth. And it's basically acting as a barrier to protect our deeper structures. So basically those, um, the roots of the teeth that we looked at earlier. So something that can happen when the gingiva get inflamed is something called gingivitis. This is inflammation of the gums or the gingiva. You can see on the left here, we have this normal looking gums and on the right, they're very red, irritated, inflamed and swollen. So um, when you, this is basically due to poor oral hygiene. So when you don't take care of your teeth and you don't, you don't brush and floss often or regularly, um, the gums can get uh, infected. And then they actually, since they're that barrier for deeper structures, then deeper structures can eventually um, be affected. And unhealthy gums can really lead to tooth, tooth loss if not corrected early. So that's why it's very important to maintain healthy gums. Okay, so now we're gonna move on um, into the oral cavity and talk about the tongue. So the tongue is going to help us move food around in the oral cavity and help us articulate words. And then this is where a sensation of taste first begins. And the tongue is basically, a, it's a muscular um, structure. So there are intrinsic muscles, intrinsic meaning internal to the tongue, and there are muscles that are inside of the tongue innervated by a nerve called hypoglossal nerve. That's another cranial nerve for us. And then there are extrinsic muscles or external to the tongue, and they basically attach between the tongue and other structures of the mouth or chin. So if you look in your oral cavity, there are a couple of things here. They're called folds or membranes, and they connect the floor of the mouth to the middle of the underside of the tongue. So this one right under our tongue is our lingual frenulum. And so you can see it on yourself, or you can look at a partner near you. If you lift your tongue, you can see that there's a midline structure that kind of ties the, the tongue down to the floor of the mouth. And then we actually have a little frenulum in the midline for our upper and lower lips. They're not as pronounced as the tongue, but you can see them if you lower your, your lips or you raise your upper lip, you can see that midline frenulum, which is basically just an anchor for the lips and the tongue to the roof of the mouth and then to the gums. Okay, so I said that um, the tongue is kind of that first place where taste sensation begins. That's because we have taste buds on our tongue. So these are called papillae, and there are four different kinds. Um, we're not going to necessarily hold you to um, all four different kinds and their shapes and structures, but the one thing that you probably want to know is that the um, filiform papillae uh, do not contain taste buds. 
So these uh, fungiform, phthalate, and folate all do have taste buds, so they do help with taste sensation, but the filiform do not. Okay, so that's maybe something that you saw earlier, and you might want to remember that for later. So in talking about the tongue, there are a couple of things we can um, discuss. This first one is something called geographic tongue. And it's not very common, but it does affect about two to three out of every hundred people. And it's basically these areas of smooth red or, and then patchy areas of white. And it's called geographic tongue because some people say it kind of resembles a map with patchy islands. Um, it's not necessarily something that causes a problem, though. There aren't really any symptoms. It's just something that you can visually see on the tongue. Shouldn't cause any problems for people that have it, though. Uh, one thing that is a problem, though, is something called what you probably have heard as thrush, if you ever heard of it before. Um, it's oral candidiasis. So it's basically a candida fungal infection that grows. It can be anywhere in the mouth or oral cavity, but it's most common on the tongue. And it's really common in babies or young kids who are on antibiotics. The antibiotics basically kill off that normal flora in the mouth, and then that fungus is able to overgrow. Uh, but it's easily treated with antifungals, and it doesn't typically cause any long-term problems. Okay, so we talked about the teeth, the gums, the tongue, and now we're going to talk about the palate. So this is basically the roof of the mouth. Um, so both of these pictures, if you kind of orient yourself, you're basically the camera is inside the mouth looking up at the roof of the mouth. So the palate, this hard part of your mouth, and then a back soft part, it kind of separates your oral cavity from the nasal cavity above. And it's divided into a, let's see, a hard palate. Here you can see it in front of the red line. And then that is made of bone, which is why it's called the hard palate. And then if you go behind the red line, you can see the soft palate. And that is made up of numerous muscles. Okay, and you can probably feel that on yourself if you lift your tongue up to the roof of your mouth. You can feel that there's a hard palate uh, kind of anterior or towards the front. And then as you move your tongue backwards, you can feel that it's a little bit softer, and that's where those muscles are coming in. Um, and this isn't quite as important for you guys. Um, I'll just show you. Um, the hard palate and the soft palate are innervated by two different nerves. So I just want you to see that this, it's called greater palatine nerve and artery. They run forward towards the, the, the front, the anterior, to do the hard palate. And then the lesser palatine nerve and artery, they run posteriorly or towards the back to innervate the soft palate. So greater is up front and then lesser is towards the posterior or towards the back. And then um, at the bottom of this picture, you can see the start of the uvula. Um, so that's, you know, the hangy down thing in the back of your throat. That's called the uvula. And I'll show it to you on another image here. So this is a muscular structure, hangs in the back portion of the soft palate. So this is hanging down from those kind of muscles. And um, uh, it's usually hanging in the midline. And then it can be helpful if you need to assess um, like a nerve injury to something called the vagus nerve. So if there is a problem with the vagus nerve, um, then those muscles that help elevate the palate can't do that anymore. So let's say, um, so we're looking at the patient, so the, the X is on their left side. So if that left side is knocked out, those muscles cannot lift the uvula. So then when we try and contract or work those muscles, only the right side is going to lift up. So that uvula will actually be pulled away from the side that's injured. So that's something that you can kind of remember is if you have a vagus nerve injury on the left, then your uvula will point towards the right and then vice versa. If you have a vagus nerve injury on the right, then your uvula will point towards the left. Okay, another thing that's kind of interesting about the uvula and um, is called a bifid uvula or cleft uvula. So you can see here it actually has kind of two portions to it. And basically during uh, embryonic development, the um, 
the two sides don't fuse together completely. So they're coming together to meet in the midline. If they don't completely fuse, you'll have basically two portions that hang down. And it's abnormal looking, but it doesn't really cause any problems. So it might just be something that you can visibly see, but shouldn't give you any um, symptoms. It shouldn't make it any dip more difficult to speak or to swallow or anything like that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some lymphoid tissue. Uh, you guys probably have seen these on yourselves or on a friend before. These are your tonsils. So essentially they're the immune system's first line of defense against ingested pathogens. So anything that can come in through the oral cavity, the, uh, the tonsils are kind of that first lymphoid tissue that kind of sees those pathogens. And so they can become enlarged when they're fighting an infection. When we have basically um, immune cells that are replicating to start fighting, that's where that's happening. That's why those tissues can get enlarged. So then, um, when you go to say you have an, an, a strep infection and you go to the doctor, they can actually grade the size of your tonsils. And the, the bigger they are, the bigger, like the higher the number in grading. So a zero basically means that your, your tonsils have been surgically removed. And then as you move up one, you can kind of see the tonsils hiding out between those pillars. Two, they extend beyond the pillars. These pillars are just this part of the soft palate here that hangs down. And then three, they are beyond the pillars and four, they're actually touching in the midline. So they've kind of gone all the way out towards the uvula and they are touching from left to right. Okay, so that's it on the tonsils. And then I think the last thing we're gonna talk about are the salivary glands. So they're helping us produce saliva, which is secreted into the mouth. And saliva is very important because there are enzymes in it that already help us start breaking down food as early as in the oral cavity. So we can actually start breaking down carbs um, with an enzyme called amylase as soon as uh, food um, enters the oral cavity via the saliva. And then saliva also contains immunoglobulins, which those are uh, substances that help us fight pathogens. And again, we know that we can ingest pathogens very easily through the oral cavity. So that saliva is important in that respect. And then there are different types of salivary glands on each side of the mouth. So there's three here that we're gonna talk about. This one here in front of the ear, it's pretty big. It's called the parotid gland. And you can see it has a duct that goes all the way up towards the front of the mouth to get into the oral cavity. And then there's two smaller ones, this submandibular gland. So mandible was that lower part of our jaw. Sub means below. So submandibular is here below the mandible. And then sublingual is just there below the tongue. Okay, so those are our three. Um, and we will look at them each kind of one at a time. So the parotid gland, that one in front of the ear, it is the biggest of the three salivary glands. So it's in the cheek outside of the oral cavity, but it's secretions, it's helping us form saliva. So it needs to be able to open into the oral cavity. So that's why we have this duct here. Um, so in the picture, it's called Stinson's duct. Uh, it's also just called the parotid duct. That's a little easier to remember for you guys. So that's how these um, secretions can get from the gland to the oral cavity. And then um, it opens up through something called the parotid papilla in the mouth at the upper, kind of near the molars in the upper mouth to reach the oral cavity. So something that can happen to the parotid gland is that it can get inflamed. This can happen from bacteria, viruses, autoimmune diseases, and even stones, kind of calcifications that can block the duct, and that backs the saliva up back into the gland, and that can cause inflammation or swelling. So one of the most common causes that causes parotitis or swelling of the parotid gland is something called mumps. So it uh, didn't used to be um, heard as often because of uh, something called vaccines, but as some people choose not to vaccinate anymore, you're seeing kind of a, a comeback of, of viruses like measles, mumps, and rubella. So that's the MMR vaccine that you maybe you've heard of that actually helps vaccinate against this virus. So if you get 
peritonitis or mumps, um, it can cause this, this swelling or inflammation of the parotid gland. And it can actually be pretty serious because it can cause long-term complications like deafness. So remember this gland is right here near the ear. It can actually cause nerve damage that results in permanent deafness. And then it can, it can also progress to meningitis or an inflammation of the meninges in the brain and spinal cord and then infertility in adulthood. So that's not something you want to mess around with if you don't have to. So that was the parotid gland, our biggest of the three. Now we're going to look at the submandibular and the sublingual glands. So they're kind of here underneath the mouth, um, submandibular here. You can kind of see it here is the ghosted mandible for us. And then sublingual would be right here under the tongue. Um, so the submandibular is kind of the next biggest in size, but it actually produces the most saliva. So that's kind of interesting since it's not the biggest of the three, but it does produce the most saliva. And then it's near that mandible and its secretions come up through this little submandibular duct you can see here. Then it actually opens into something called the sublingual papilla, even though it's not the sublingual gland. So that's a little bit different in the naming. So submandibular gland through the submandibular duct opens up into something called the sublingual papilla. And then the smallest uh, of the three glands and the, the smallest amount of saliva produced is from this sublingual gland. And it has uh, like eight to 20 small little unnamed ducts that open under your tongue in the floor of, of your mouth. So sometimes um, people that can kind of spit saliva or you know, sometimes it's called gleeking, that's actually coming up through those papilla underneath the tongue. Okay, so that's actually everything for the lecture portion. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to chat with us through here. Um, if we don't have any questions, we will go ahead and move on to a break for you guys and we'll get set up for the dissection. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you guys have if you want to send those our way. Okay, so um, we had a question asking if we could talk a little more about cavities and how they form. So I might, let's see. I can pull that slide back up for you guys. Oh, well, it's gonna take forever. Can I just scroll down here? There we go. Okay. So I was just going to pull this um, screen back up for you guys so you can kind of visualize what's happening as I talk about it. So kind of the first thing, knowing that in the oral cavity, we do have normal bacteria. You know, we have normal bacteria in our guts, in our mouths, on our skin. This isn't anything that's to be concerned with. It's just part of life. So these bacteria that are in our mouth, Say you eat something and you don't regularly brush your teeth. So maybe you add something really sweet and sugary and those sugars are still kind of there on your teeth. Well, over time, the bacteria in our mouth can actually kind of break down those sugars and form acids. So if that's not getting regularly brushed away from your teeth, then those things can harden down on that enamel on the outer surface of the tooth. So that first forms a plaque or a hardening of this kind of substance. It kind of forms a concretion on the teeth. And when that's not brushed away uh, regularly, it can actually form something called tartar, which is much thicker and harder to break away from the tooth. So then those acids that the bacteria were forming from breaking down all these sugars, the acid can wear through the enamel. So the enamel is really that tough outer coating, but it can be broken down. So that first step, it says that this takes time. So that is something that is kind of happening over time. So you can imagine this is someone that's not brushing their teeth regularly for, for months and months. This doesn't just happen overnight because you forgot to brush your teeth before you went to bed. So this is a process. Um, so then if you wear through that enamel, 
So the acids are kind of wearing through this outer coating. Then if we get down to dentin, the dentin is kind of inside the enamel and it's much softer and the acid can wear that down really quickly. And that's where those nerves are at. So that's why it can be painful when you first get a cavity. Maybe when you chew your food, it might kind of send a little shock down your that tooth. That's kind of that nerve pain when, when the breakdown of enamel has gotten down all the way to the dentin. And then um, if it extends even further, it can get down into the pulp and that's where actually infections can then arise from cavities because then pockets of little, you know, bacteria and swelling can form down here in the pulp where usually it wouldn't have been able to get down that far. So the main thing is just the bacteria that are kind of breaking down the sugars that are not brushed away from our teeth regularly. And then that acid can start wearing away at the outer coating of the tooth. So that's why it's important to brush your teeth regularly twice a day and also floss so that you're, you're kind of keeping those like sugars and those food particles that were in your mouth off of the teeth so that they can't then form these hardened concretions called plaque and tartar. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started with today's dissection portion. So just while you guys are getting in a good position to see whatever uh, mandible you have on site and the cameras, I'm just going to go through a couple of uh, interesting trivia questions for you guys. You don't need to enter anything into us, just kind of as a group, uh, maybe yell out the answers and then the winners. We're still getting ready. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so a couple of you guys are just uh, getting ready still, so uh, I'll hold off on these questions for just a few more minutes. All right, just as you guys are getting wrapped up, I'm just gonna ask a, a couple of trivia questions. Uh, and so, like I said, go ahead and just answer in your groups. Uh, and uh, it's more of just like a fun facts and stuff. So if you guys aren't quite ready for the dissection yet, that's okay. So <clears throat> the first question, uh, these are all from dairymoose.com, just interesting facts about cows. And uh, I thought they were pretty interesting. Most of you might be familiar with a lot of this stuff already uh, living out here in Missouri. So the first one is, how do cows get grass into their mouths? So do they bite it? Do they use their, their hooves to put it into their mouth? Just to kind of you know, say to yourself, how, how is it that they get the grass into their mouths? So I'll give you kind of five seconds to think about it and then I'll give you the answer in a second. So pretty out They bite it. All right, so in actuality, cows do not bite grass. Uh, they curl it with their tongue, and then they use the front incisors to shear it. Kind of interesting. Yeah. Okay, so the second one is a dairy cow can produce how much saliva per day? And to give you a kind of a reference point, a human produces about two pounds of saliva each day. So, how much saliva does a cow produce every day? Going out 30 pounds. So, the answer is 125 pounds of saliva a day. Okay, the next one is uh, how does a cow spend their 24 hour day? So, do they sleep a lot? Are they eating most of the day? Those of you that have seen a cow, what are they usually doing? Yes, eating is correct. Uh, we have uh, someone on the chat that is correct. So they spend eight hours of their day eating, eight hours chewing their regurgitated cud, and then eight hours sleeping. So basically, 16 hours they're chewing. Okay, the next one, the average cow will eat how much feed per day? Again, as a reference, humans eat about five pounds. And we'll say, you know, for, for an average 200 pound person, uh, cows can weigh between 1,000 and 1,800 pounds. 
So if you do quick math, you know, that'd be about nine times as much as a 200 pound human for like a good sized cow, 1800 pounds. So maybe use that into your calculation. A human eats about five pounds a day. How much does a cow eat per day? Okay, so again, if you were to do the math, you know, you times five by nine, I think that's still 45, but they actually eat 100 pounds of feed per day. So they're, they're consistently eating a lot. Okay, and then the next one, how much uh, does a cow move their jaw each day? So if you were to sit there, you know, with a tally marker, counting how many times you could see them sliding their teeth back and forth each day, about how many movements do you think you'd see? So the answer to that one is about 40,000 times in a day. Okay, so uh, some of you probably uh, know the next question. How many chambers are in a cow's stomach? Yeah, I think I heard the answer. That's four. That's correct. So the, the next question then is, why do they have four chambers in their, in their stomachs? So I'm no cow specialist, but... Uh, Basically, what happens, cows uh, are a kind of a different uh, type of, of animal called ruminants. And so they're able to live off of grass, even though they cannot uh, by themselves digest cellulose. So if you or I you know, were to eat grass, we really wouldn't get any nutrition out of it. Uh, and so what they, what they uh, have designed as part of their systems is uh, they break down the grass, regurgitate it up and continue to chew it to give the grass uh, the, the most bacterial exposure possible. So it's really the bacteria that are digesting the cellulose down into usable uh, chunks of energy for the cows. So I thought that was kind of interesting stuff. Being that today's dissection is pretty short, I just wanted to you know, have a little bit of extra uh, information for you there. So those of you that do have uh, a cow mandible with you, I'd like you to just bring it out, get it in a position where you can look at it. I'll uh, try the best that I can to uh, maneuver this one up here so that you can get a sense for those of you that do not have one. So first off, you probably noticed this when you walked into the lab, but uh, it smells uh, fantastic. I, I think I'm gonna ask if I can take one of these home to, to keep as an air freshener in our house. So that's the first thing you know I want you to orient you to, get a nice big whiff of this. <laughs> the second thing is the size. Notice just how big this is compared to you know uh, your mandible. So here you can see that this is just the bottom portion of the of the mouth so these are the bottom teeth here and uh another thing that you might notice that's different than than what you've probably seen in your own mouth is this big space right here so there's a big space where there are no teeth present so i'll try and get it to, to where you can kind of see there is one little tooth still up here in the front and if you've ever seen a deer they have a similar jaw you can see that they have the type of teeth that we call the incisors and canines more at the very front of the of the mandible and then there's a big space here called the diastema and then we have the premolars and the molars and uh, another thing that's that's kind of interesting is uh, various mammals have different teeth count so uh, the den the dentists kind of treat it uh, on one side either the top or the bottom is kind of how they produce the formulas. So for example, let me get a human one up here for you. So this would be a, the bottom part of, uh, on a human, what we were looking at before. So the way that they do the count is they'll name, or I, I guess they'll count the, the first types of teeth. So it would be two, and that, so two incisors, one canine, two premolars, and then there's typically three uh, molars, but like in this model, the wisdom tooth would have been removed. So the count that you would say in an abbreviated form in a human would be two over two, one over one, two over two, three over three. 
So it's a little bit different if you look on the cow. I know that you can't see the incisors or the canines, uh, but the count for a cow, uh, just saying the bottom, it would be three, one, three, three. So they have three incisors, one canine, three premolars, and three molars. And it's kind of interesting because it's a little bit different on top. So they don't have any incisors or canines on the very top portion. So to say the complete count, it would be zero over three, zero over one, three over three, three over three. So uh, kind of an interesting thing. Uh, again, some of you probably already knew that they didn't have any teeth on the top. Instead, they have what's called a dental pad. And that goes back to what we were talking about with that first question, that they don't really bite the grass. They swirl it with their tongue and they use their lower incisors uh, to kind of uh, shear it off like a shear. So that's one thing to kind of notice. You can see here uh, that the, this particular model has one of the premolars already removed. And then here's another one. Here's the third one. And then there are three different molars behind it. So <clears throat> unlike a human, a cow has uh, no root system. So it's called like a non-rooted tooth. And essentially, uh, that means that they continuously grow. So in a human, we'll have teeth and then they'll, they'll uh, stop growing and they're, they're just attached to our, our bone via that uh, periodontal ligament that we were talking about before. Uh, these teeth continuously grow. And so when we pull it out, we'll notice that there will be uh, some differences. So I have here another model. And I'm going to be kind of comparing some of the teeth uh, in a human to that that we'll see along uh, this uh, dissection that we're doing here. So the first step that I'd like you to do uh, is to grab a set of pliers. Go grab one. The uh, premolars are a little bit easier to pull out. So do your best to get like a good firm hold. And see if you can pull it out. And this one is actually broken. I, I attempted to, to pull it out earlier because I didn't want to look like a fool if I couldn't do it in front of everybody. So yeah, go ahead and yank one of those out. I'll give you just a minute to do that. And then we'll take a look at the tooth up a little bit closer and kind of compare it a little bit to the, the human tooth. I'll give you about a minute or two if you want to go ahead and pull that out. All right, so this tooth that, uh, that I pulled out here, broke in half, which is gonna be you know, fortuitous for us in just a minute to be able to look kind of down the center of it. And uh, notice that you can see the pearly white on the tip. And as you might guess, you know, that's the enamel. And uh, I'm not gonna call these roots because you know, by nef definition, they're, they're supposed to be rootless teeth because they continuously grow. And uh, I was, I was kind of talking uh, you know, to somebody in the know about this kind of stuff as to how it really works in the growth. And so I'll explain that uh, in just a minute as well. So uh, I'm gonna get to one of these other model teeth out here. Open that up and we can, we can look at both of them this way. Let's see. Yeah, that one opens. Okay, so hopefully that's coming ac across a little bit. So you already know the anatomy of a human tooth where we, we have the enamel, 
some dentin, and then the area in the middle, the pulp that has the nerves and uh, the blood vessels. So <clears throat> in this live tooth, again, you can get a sense for the enamel. And if I turn it up, you can kind of get a sense. Uh, I'm going to put these other ones down for just a second so that I can point at this. But uh, you'll see that there's this little groove right here. It's kind of a little bit blurry. Sorry, let me hold it still for just a minute. Let's see if the focus is a little bit better. Anyway, you'll be able to see this uh, hopefully on the ones that you have there with you. But uh, there's there are these different ridges. So there's like a white ridge and then more of a dark ridge. And then there's like a little yellowish color in between. So if you think about a tooth continuously growing, uh, what's going to allow for ridges to form in order uh, to, to properly be able to grind the food for the cow? Well, there are these different vertical ridges uh, that form of the enamel, and then between them, like this dark or lighter material, is uh, the dentin. And so then you could kind of imagine as a, chew, or as a cow is uh, chewing away, the, the, the dentin is not going to be as resilient. So it's going to wear away faster than the ridges of enamel. And that's going to allow for the, the ridges of the tooth. And I guess even in like elephants and so forth, they have a, a pretty complex pattern that uh, and, and shapes that, that, uh, that this design will allow in order for them to, to better be able to chew. And so you can kind of see this. I'm going to bring up the, the other model. And you can see this on multiple teeth here. Okay, so try and look for the, the white enamel areas, and then you can see also there's, there's going to be some dark areas, and again, the people in the note told me that that's actually cementin, uh, so there's, there's going to be, you know, some variation between the human tooth and, and this type of a tooth that's continuously growing. You can see that vertical white ridge here. Then there's kind of some yellow dentin, again, some cementin for the chewing. Okay, well, uh, if you guys have any uh, questions, go ahead and send them in this way. The last thing that I did want to show you, the, the teeth uh, of the cow do have a pulp but it's actually down lower. It's not really very well seen. It just kind of looks like some spongy material. Again, I apologize if it won't focus in very well, but it looks just kind of like sponge. And so uh, if you've ever studied anatomy, it, it's uh, kind of like a uh, spongy bone in appearance. It doesn't stick out super well on the, on the camera here. But uh, yeah, so this, this stays down at the base because it's like the nervous and blood supply. Uh, and then the, the tooth would continue continually grow and, and be worn down as the cow chews. So kind of interesting. Last off, I just wanted to uh, ask one more question that's going to kind of uh, kick us off into the future labs about uh, the other animals that we might be dissecting. So the question is, what is the best mammal next to humans, of course? So the answer is pigs, and that's what we're going to be dissecting next. And the reason why is because uh, you can feed them an apple and they'll give you bacon. <laughs> so that's kind of an old person joke, and uh, we'll uh, leave you guys with that, and uh, hope hopefully we'll see you guys uh, in a little while for the phase two. Have a good night.